to just kind of start out, and my theme is really going to be how we manage the workforce. And it will take into consideration the future of work. It will, you know, talk about the surroundings that we have. It will talk about, you know, how we work today. I picked 1989. I picked 1989 because that's when I started at Microsoft. And I thought I'd maybe just sort of start by recollecting what work was like for me in 1989. And I actually took some pictures from 1989, which seemed to me an eternity ago now. I mean, you look at the computers, look at the people, look at you know, the kind of things in the way we communicated with each other. It looks so antiquated. But really, it's not that long ago. You start here and you say, what was work like in 1989? Well, I went into an office. And my office looked like other people's offices. We had similar offices. We had a similar computer on our office. We sat together as a group. Our manager sat across the hall from us. So everybody knew what was going on. And Microsoft knew what was going on because, because we sat in a building that was identified. We had a way of working. We had something specific to work on, and that's what we did. It was, for me, highly liberating. It was my first really big job after business school. And I thought, this is such a great place. Look at all this autonomy I had. There are no clocks on the wall. I can come into work when I want. I have this computer. It's so great. It was the most controlled environment you can imagine. In 1989, it was all about control. You went into an office, a physical space, that was your office. When you went home, you didn't really work from home because you couldn't take the one computer they gave you with you. And if you could, the notion of using your phone line to dial in when somebody might want to be calling you, that wasn't working either. So, and when I look back, I say, gosh, some of it I look at fondly. And otherwise, I look at it and say, wow, the notion of work then was a very controlled activity. People just did what they were told. It was with the computer, there was more information to share, but still nothing like we have today. So I think, gosh, if we started there, where do we end up today? So I just picked today. We'll just sort of zip right past that time between 89 and 2012. These are pictures from the campus at Microsoft in Redmond today. Look at the difference. Look at the difference in the way we work. Big open spaces. Lots of opportunity to interact with each other. Lots of visual things posted on the wall all over the place. A campus that looks like a campus. It's got a big fountain in the middle. We have restaurants. People play soccer. People play baseball. People play cricket. I mean, it's, it is a, it's a home away from home. But the amount of information that travels amongst our employees and through our campus, and the fact that those walls are becoming less and less visible to people, because sometimes you're in the office, and sometimes you're not in the office, but you're kind of always in the office because that phone that's represented there is piping your email to you 24 hours a day if you allow it. So that notion of how we managed people in a very controlled environment to today, where we look at the opportunity to kind of push the walls out bring people closer together, put managers in different proximity to the people they actually manage, give people multiple devices to get information, create information, and send out information. So to Tim's point about this idea of where all information comes from and how you manage it, it's a whole different world today. I can't, my manager just can't see whether I'm in my office or not and say, oh, it must be doing a good job. They're sitting in their office working. So you take that evolution and you say, what's the difference in managing? Well, as a leader or a manager in a company, you have to figure out how you take that technology, 
how you take the aspirations of your employees to work with other people and figure out how to come up with some commonalities. We still have some level of control. People still come into a physical office in Redmond for the most part, not everybody, but it's, it's a different time frame. Some people work from home for a while. Some people work from home afterwards. Some people work on the go, but there is still that central office. So we've had to evolve the social aspects. I'll call it the, the, the social contract we have with our employees because they have ultimate liberty to use technology to work from anywhere. We don't physically see them very often. Frankly, there are 40,000 people sitting on our Redmond campus, and there are 95,000 people in the company as a whole. So unlike the, the, the smaller shops, we can't see them to begin with, so we have to find a different way to manage the outcomes we're trying to get to, not control the people. Manage to an outcome. That's really the whole point of work. You've got to manage to an outcome. So I'm going to show you a video here. And it's going to be 2032. This is actually a video we produced from our Microsoft Office group as a, as a thought-provoking exercise for the team to think about what should work look like? What can work look like? What devices will exist? How will people work in the world? So I'm going to kick that off. And you can just watch. There's no background to it at all. But it shows you the different ways people will interact with technology. And while there are still physical spaces, those physical spaces are really transcended by technology. Information comes to you in a different way. Information gets consumed in a different way. The physical notion of paper, which I think if you go to 89 was pretty common. You go to 2012, it's less common. You go to 2032, it's virtually non-existent. But you, you look at how people are interacting with each other and interacting with the world around them. And you say, what does the manager, the leader, what does the workforce expect from us going forward? And I think if you take it to its most extreme sense, you say you will have to create that social contract where you may never see an employee, you may never understand their workplace, but in some way you have to create a common outcome that you're all working toward. And you have to find a way to communicate with that person as to whether, or those people, as to whether you're making progress on that or not making progress on that. And I think that's a challenge. I don't know that our current managerial force is really ready for that today. I think we're still used to a very structured environment. So the challenge for us is going to be how do we think about taking that to the next step? Well, what does it mean? It means a higher level of communication with people. You have to not only give direction, but take direction. Go back to the even before 1989. The very traditional sense of the workforce is it's hierarchical. There's someone at the top who makes the decisions pushes those decisions down to the people who work in that organization, they follow those directions, and something gets produced. Well, the evolution of the workforce is, these days, people want to know what they should be doing. But particularly our newer generation of the workforce, they'd like to tell us how it should get done. And so for those of us who are sort of in between that stage in our lives, how much do you listen and how much do you direct? Because technology is empowering, and technology empowers them to know more than I know. And, and you, embracing that is hard. You, you get to, to my age and you think, yes, there, it's not possible for you, 20-year-old, to know as much as I do, because I've been in the workforce a lot longer than you have. It's so wrong. Technology is empowerment for people. And we can either sort of say, gosh, in this new world of 2032, we can manage the same way and it will be fine. 
it won't be fine. We are going to have to evolve that contract we have with people who work for us. We're going to have to be capable with our technologies. We're going to have to figure out how they not only watch what's happening, but empower the right thing to happen, and that both sides of the equation agree to that. And I think that's just a change. It's a change in the evolution of business, and that's what technology is going to foster. To me, it's super exciting. I watched that minute and a half video, and I think, what an exciting world that technology can bring. And then I look back as a manager and I say, wow, what do I need to do to be ready for that to happen? What do I need to do sort of educationally to get myself up to speed? What do I have to do personally to change the way I work with other people? And what do I have to do as a leader to figure out how we make 2032 the most exciting time for everyone? You know, I happen to work in a place where there's a lot of investment in new and interesting things. I have the benefit of that. If I didn't, I'd certainly want to go learn about it because I do think the evolution of our workforce is very different than what we expect today. And we're going to look at that 2032 film, and in the next two or three years, some of that will be very real. It's not that far away. So when do we start preparing ourselves for it? I think we have to prepare ourselves for it now. It's exciting. It's fascinating. I love gestures, and I love the idea that you will see things. I li love the idea that holograms will appear. You won't attend a meeting anymore. A hologram will attend on your behalf. I, you know, it's freeing and scary at the same time. But, but that's the kind of world we sort of say, well, yeah, you only see that in the movies until all of a sudden it's real. And we have to be prepared for that. So I think the future is exciting. I think that social contract is something we have to think about with our employees. And I think technology is going to make the entire world of work different in a much shorter time than we think it will. Thank you very much for your time.